Ayabuan. It's said that the only thing that's constant in the universe is change. And indeed, everywhere we look, we see constant change. In fact, to sustain life itself, life must constantly change, like an airplane that has to move through the air to fly. So we've tried to grasp the nature of this change by various means. Modern science has investigated and documented this change, but at a very superficial level, as far as our experience is concerned. The I Ching and tools like that have done a better job because they delve into the psychological dimensions of change. But their approaches still assume that we are the effect of change and there isn't a whole lot we can do about it without some external power. However, the teaching of the Buddha has gone the deepest into the science of change, how change arises, how it proceeds, and the means by which we can influence it for our better. This is called dependent origination, paticca samupada, and it's studied by every Buddhist. In fact, I'll probably be studying this for the rest of my life. It's a very, very deep subject, a complex subject, and we can't really do it justice in a short video. We're planning to do a whole series on dependent origination later on. But for now, for purposes of Paritta chanting, we need to know the definitions of the terms used, which was covered in the previous video. But now we need to understand how they interact, and especially the form of representation that we have chosen for dependent origination, which incorporates the Eightfold Path. We got this form from Buddha Das Bhikkhu, a very important monk from Thailand, who was the first one to see through the traditional misinterpretations of dependent origination, and understand that it operates on all time scales, from the universal down to the microscopic, from eons and millions of years of change to lifetimes down to microseconds. And these same steps, these same uh, increments of change, the same process of cause and effect is operating on many different scales. So to really understand dependent origination, first of all, we have to see it like that. It's a process that can be big or small, can be fast or slow, just depending on the nature of the objects uh, to which it applies. Another thing about dependent origination is that it's a process of causality. And in, in the suttas, the Buddha calls it this, that causality. When this is present, that happens. When this is not present, that doesn't happen. So this, that causality means that the very presence of a thing then creates a chain of effects, each one becoming the cause of the next effect on down the line. So the dependent origination begins from ignorance. And Buddha defines ignorance as ignorance of suffering, ignorance of the cause of suffering, ignorance of the cessation of suffering and the path to cessation of suffering. When we're talking about dependent origination, we're talking about the causes of suffering. How does suffering begin? How does it evolve? And how does it finally manifest in our lives? It begins from ignorance. Because we are ignorant of the Four Noble Truths, when we come into this world, we're at the effect of everything. We have so many problems. We're suffering so much. 
birth is suffering, childhood is suffering, so many uh, different social diseases that we have to pass through on our way to adulthood. Uh, these are delusions, different identities that we have to create or we think we have to create to cope. This is ignorance because we think change is happening and the only thing we can do about it is to enjoy the senses and that will somewhat counteract the effect of suffering. But that's really all we can do about it. Everything else is just fate or karma. But that's not true. Because if we can change this ignorance, if we can add knowledge, uh, even a little bit of knowledge, just like the sun is just coming up, and what happened to the darkness? As soon as one ray of sunlight comes out of the horizon, the darkness is finished and you can see. So similarly, even a small amount of knowledge is better than the ignorance into which we're all born. So the ignorance tries to tell us that there's nothing we can do about suffering except to try to counteract it. Unfortunately, the activities that we use to counteract it create more suffering, and we'll see how that is so. Actually, the cause of suffering is becoming. Dependent origination is also the process of becoming. It's how we change our being. Our being is always there, but it goes through so many changes. For example, when we're born, we're just a tiny infant. Then we become a child. Then we become a young rascal. <laughs> then a teenager. Finally, if we're lucky, we reach adulthood. And then gradually middle age and old age and finally death. So these changes are going on inexorably by the influence of time. But what created those changes? The fact that we have a being in the first place. And because that being is subject to time, it's always changing. However, Buddha has a process of approaching the deathless, the perfect, and it begins from knowledge, specifically this knowledge of dependent origination. Because of this, that conditionality or this, that causality, as soon as we uh, change the cause of something, the effect also changes. And that effect, that change ripples down through the chain of cause and effect until it manifests in our life. For example, if a person begins to understand the teaching of the Buddha, he starts to realize, well, wait a minute, there are so many things that people do, drinking, smoking, having sex, cheating, lying, stealing, and so many other things that people do that are really not a good idea because they create karma that results in suffering. These are the precepts of Buddhism. These are the, the very entry-level teaching of Buddhism. When you first walk in the door, they tell you, observe the precepts. <laughs> Why? It's not because they want to control your life. It's not because they want to restrict your enjoyment and make you miserable. No, it's so that you stop creating causes of suffering. And we'll see how that works as we go deeper into this process. So it begins from ignorance. And what's the next thing after ignorance? Fabrication, especially mental fabrications. Now, mental fabrications are all of the things that we make up that aren't really true. Well, for example, take our name. A name is something made up. Uh, we don't come out of the womb with a name stamped on our forehead. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody has to make up that name. Usually it's not us, it's someone else. But still, we accept it as, oh, this is my name. But is that name real? Do the animals in the forest have names? Well, higher animals like uh, dolphins, uh, they may actually have names. They have language, that's for sure. But still, these are something fabricated. This is not natural. It's something we add to nature. 
And because of our name, then we think we are an individual and the individual has an identity and that identity follows us our whole life. But what if identity can change? What if it's a fluid thing? What if it's not fixed? What if it can be altered to have different effects? See, that's what we're getting at here. The process of dependent origination gives us the means to change things that we normally consider unchangeable. Our identity, our desires, our knowledge, our sense activities, and so on. And this can lead us to a higher state of being. So fabrications are there. Fabrications, let me give you an example of a fabrication. A corporation. Three or four people get together and they say, let's start a corporation. There are numerous tax advantages and liability advantages and so on. It's a great idea. What do we do first? Create a fictitious name. It's even called this in the legal literature. And you apply for a fictitious name. <laughs> so you make your fictitious name and then you incorporate under that name. And an incorporated entity is something that has the rights of a person, a legal person. However, it's not a person. Well, what is it actually? You might say, well, here's the corporate offices and here's the factories, and here are all the workers. This is the corporation. No, that's not the corporation. That's people doing stuff in the name of the corporation. But the corporation, all it is is an agreement. It's just some words on paper. It's something that people created. It's an abstraction that people created to do business. That's all. It's not a real thing. It's something like a child. A child may have a, a teddy bear or another, <laughs> like uh, Calvin and Hobbes. Huh? To Calvin, Hobbes is a, a real tiger, a big tiger, and they go around and have adventures together. And sometimes um, Hobbes will pounce on him, uh, and they'll wrestle, and all of this stuff is going on. But from Calvin's mother's point of view, Calvin's just a little boy, and he's got this little stuffed tiger that he drags around with him everywhere. So, where is Hobbes' actual existence? It's in Calvin's imagination. And it's the same thing with our different abstractions like corporations, countries, political parties, philosophies, religions. Huh? These only exist in our imagination. They're software. They're just information. They're abstractions. They don't have a real concrete existence. And yet, people are willing to die for their religion. They're willing to die for their country. Huh? This, is this nuts or what? Are you starting to see? If we change our knowledge, if we understand that so many of the things that we think are real in life are actually fabrications, then so many other things will change. We won't be so attached to them. We won't be willing to hurt ourselves or others in the name of the pursuit of this abstraction. And so many things will become better in our lives as a result. So this is just a small example of how the study of dependent origination can benefit us. Now let's move on. Fabrication is the cause of consciousness. And the Buddha is very specific about what he means by consciousness. He says consciousness, eye consciousness, ear consciousness, tongue consciousness, nose consciousness, body consciousness, and intellect consciousness. These are the six types of consciousness. So in other words, any consciousness that we have is consciousness of one of these six things. And if you observe yourself, you'll find that this is true. There is no such thing as pure consciousness. There is no entity that is only consciousness. There's always a body, senses, and sense objects involved in every moment of consciousness. If you observe yourself, you'll find this to be true. And by the way, I should mention that all these truths come from the Buddha's research into his own experience. This is called phenomenological self-observation. 
And this process has to go on for us to attain self-realization. We can't just accept a truth from the Buddha or from somebody else and say, okay, that's it. That's the one true way. <laughs> that's religion. And the Buddha is not giving a religion. He's giving a scientific process of self-observation, which he performed himself. And if you follow the stages and you sincerely observe yourself, according to the categories of observation established by the Buddha, you will see the same things. One of the things that you will see is consciousness is always consciousness of senses and sense objects. So consciousness is there. But what about the quality of consciousness? If our consciousness of sense objects is mixed up with fabrications, we literally start to become conscious of things that aren't real. For example, mine. Huh? The idea of ownership, of acquisition of something. Uh, this is a total fabrication. Actually, this thing exists and that thing exists and my body exists and I exist. But am I really the owner of this thing? What happens when I die? Am I still the owner? They say you can't take it with you, and it's true. So what is really going on here is that we have a process where we establish the idea of I as a fabrication, and then we establish the idea of ownership. And again, people are willing to fight and die over issues of ownership. It's said that 90% of the law deals with ownership, property, and its acquisition and disposition and so on. So look how much time and energy we put into this idea, this abstraction of ownership. So similarly, there are many abstractions that we believe in, and we even are conscious of them. But this is synthetic consciousness. This is mental consciousness. Real consciousness is only of the senses and the sense objects and the primitive functions of the mind. There's so much that we create, that we fabricate. You know, one of the meanings of fabrication is a lie. So we lie to ourselves, we deceive ourselves, and then we deceive others by insisting that they believe in the same deceptions. And then we wonder, why am I suffering? <laughs> <laughs> Dependent origination lays it all out. So if we can overcome our ignorance and see our fabrications for what they are, all of a sudden we can understand so many classes of consciousness that we experience are actually illusions. And we can stop acting on them. Another feature of dependent origination is that as the chain of cause and effect comes down from ignorance, fabrication, consciousness to name and form and so on. It becomes harder and harder to change anything. Harder and harder to have an influence on the outcome. For example, we earlier we mentioned the precepts of Buddhism, no stealing, no lying and so on. Well, if you try to observe the precepts of Buddhism without changing your consciousness, it's going to be very difficult. It's going to be artificial. It's going to be a struggle. You'll fail. There's no way you can do it. Because the animal desires will overcome any moral urge <laughs> to uh, observe the precepts. So, in order to observe these precepts, you could consider the precepts a test to see if you have successfully changed your consciousness. Because if you change something at the level of fabrication or consciousness, then it's very easy to influence the rest of the process. And the senses, the activities of the senses, craving, clinging, and becoming, and so on, automatically fall into line. It's an automatic process. Let me give you an example. Suppose we have a factory, and we have a robot in a factory manufacturing something. So what is the robot doing? It's simply following its program. 
So anything that you tell the robot to do, that's what it's going to do. So if you change the software, if you change the program that's being given to the robot, then the robot's actions are going to change and it's going to start manufacturing something else. Similarly, you could look at process of dependent origination as a very sophisticated, very complex robotic function built into nature. And if you institute a change in the higher levels of the programming of the software, uh, knowledge instead of ignorance, uh, truth instead of fabrication, consciousness of the reality instead of consciousness of some abstraction, and so on, then very easily, effortlessly, in fact, the rest of the thing changes, and finally you find yourself with much less suffering than you had before. The other side of the diagram, the green buttons, are the things that happen when you change the things on the red side of the diagram. <laughs> These are the stages of the Eightfold Path, beginning from integrity. What happens when you eliminate ignorance? You develop integrity. You stop lying, you stop cheating, you stop doing things that damage yourself and hurt others. And you begin the process of self-realization on the proper platform. So what happens when you finally stop fabrication of things that aren't real? Well, you reach contentment. How can you be content if you're always chasing these phantoms, these dreams that don't really exist? Huh? These false desires, these abstractions. So as soon as we stop fabrication, we reach contentment. As soon as we stop consciousness of these false ideas and fabrications, then we, we reach rapture. We become able to meditate. Did you ever try to meditate and sit down and look inside and there's just nothing? There's just black. <laughs> Why is that? Because we have been conditioned to a certain type of consciousness that I would call objective consciousness, looking out through the senses at the world, and if something doesn't appear in the senses, well, it's not real. The process of meditation starts from what we call reflexive consciousness. That is when we are aware of the world outside of ourselves through the senses, but at the same time, there's a process of analysis to understand what is real and what is fabrication. What am I actually seeing and what am I just projecting on the world as if it was a big movie screen? When we do this, that opens up a depth within and we can actually begin to experience real meditation. And that's going to be the subject of a whole nother series. So I'm not going to get into that. But as soon as we let go of each step, in the process of dependent origination, we experience a corresponding progress in self-realization. And so instead of trying to characterize these 12 steps of uh, letting go of ignorance, letting go of fabrication, and so on, uh, in a negative way, uh, we're characterizing them in a positive way, as these are the attributes that you will experience by letting go of that step of dependent origination. The cessation of the process of dependent origination is known as crossing the flood. Dependent origination is the flood, the flood of becoming that leads to constant suffering in life. And the Eightfold Path is the raft by which we cross over that flood and attain the peace of Nibbana and unbinding. Bomastuti, may you live long. Buddha Saranai, may the Buddha bless you. Tiruan Saranai, may the Triple Gem bless you. May you all be happy. <laughs>